Hey everybody, this is Alexander Fitzgerald or Assassinato doing another one of my lectures. Today's lecture is called Barreling Theory, Handling Multiple Streets. Let's get right into this. In today's webinar, you will learn how to handle turns in rivers. You will learn why barreling can sometimes be a terrible idea. You will learn what turns in rivers are great to barrel on. You will feel much more confident in your turn in river game. Obviously, in only a short period of time, I can't explain turn and river play in totality because that's akin to teaching someone how to play poker within 20 minutes. That said, if I show you some spots that come up hundreds of times a year, I'm confident I can prepare you to play better poker and increase your win rate. We're going to focus on in-position pots today. Let's just get the fundamentals done. I find most people struggle with even that. Now, the best way to teach you these fundamentals is to just put you in those typical spots and see how you handle them, then tell you what helps professionals in those same situations. So, in this hand, you're playing about 50 big blinds effective with the other players. You raise with ace of spades, six of clubs on the button. The big blind calls. The flop comes seven of diamonds, four of hearts, nine of clubs. The big blind checks to you. You bet half pot. The big blind calls. The turn is the king of hearts. What would you like to do in this situation? Let's see what people answer in the chat. So the chat is going to be off screen because I don't want to obscure that. I have a lot of people saying D, a lot of people saying C or D, uh, a few people saying E, uh, L in it says E, and uh, a few people saying A. So let's go ahead and take a look at the answers all over the board. Now this one, I am putting green text next to what I believe is most right when you play low to mid stakes tournaments. So I think the majority of people watching this video play low to mid stakes tournaments. And what I mean by that is tournaments up to a thousand dollars in a live buy-in, uh, maybe up to a hundred dollars online. I think generally betting half pot and betting two thirds pot technically can be made to work, but most of the time what you should be doing is trying to check. And we'll discuss why E could possibly be correct as well. So the problem on this turn card, many people will say, but isn't the king in my range? Many people protest here. That's wonderful, but most low to mid stakes opponents won't care. The vast majority of research says that people hate consenting to losses. Analytics on any poker game in the world will show folding on the flop and then a lack of folding on turn and river. So if you ever do track data of any poker game on earth, one of the things you'll find is that people fold about 50% of the time on the flop on average, which makes a lot of sense because if you look at a typical calling range, it's going to have high cards about exactly 50% of the time. So it seems like people like to fold high cards, especially out of position. That makes a lot of sense. I know I don't like calling with high cards out of position. It seems like most people won't want to do that. But typically, once people hit the call button on the button on uh, uh, hit the call button on the flop online or just call in real life, they really don't like to fold. If you are interested in this topic, I would read the Undoing Project. It's written by the same person who wrote Moneyball. It's about the men who wrote Thinking Fast and Slow, another terrific book. What is fascinating to me, guys, is not that people are illogical, but that they are systematically irrational. Look at this spot again. What do you think he's folding on the turn? What happens when you see that heads up? You generally fold the high cards, 50% fold. The see bet tends to be the statistics you, you see. Many people fast play their two pairs or better to avoid draws coming in and to build a pot. They call with their pairs. It's usually a pair that matches a card on the board combinatoric wise. So pay attention to this next part guys because this helped me range much better when I started playing poker or once I started making real money playing poker and it took me a really long time to get because uh, Flopzilla didn't exist when I started so we had to do this all by pen and paper. So it's really neat that this is available now. Now let's say in this board, he calls you on the flop with anything better than a gut shot. So we put little blue filters next to everything we think is calling out of the pre-flop 
uh, calling range that we ascribed here for him out of the big blind. And then we click this red button to green. Now look at the top of the screen. This is very neat what Flopzilla does. You highlight the part of the range that you wanna learn more about. And up top here, it'll show you the statistics about that. Look at the top of this screen. You see the combinations. His calling range is 261 combinations. Six of those are any pocket pair. In this case, eights. It represents 2% of the range. However, you'll notice the top pair combinations are 72 combos out of 261, or 27.6%. This is a huge ranging mistake that many people make in their head because they think, what do I think he has? Well, he has a nine or he has like pocket eights or something like that. That sounds like two separate hands, but the difference is 72 combos versus six, right? Going back to that again. So really what's far more likely because people tend to like to raise their two pairs to build upon, and people like to fold their high cards. Combinatoric wise, what's very likely it, when someone calls you on the flop, especially out of position, is they have a pair that matches one of the cards on the board, especially if they called out of the big blind and they have a vast array of, of hands that could make pairs because there's so many disjointed combinations that love to complete raises out of the big blind. Uh, the middle pair also, is 45 combos out of 261, as you can see in this graphic. That's 17.2% of the 261 combo co total. So 117 combos out of 261 are pairs that match a card on the board. That's without him fast playing any sets or two pairs or anything. People miss this all the time when they're studying. When you see that the flop and a guy calls you, the majority of his hands are going to be pairs that match cards on the board. That makes hand reading, that makes basic hand reading much more simple. You should generally double barrel when you think his flop pairs are folding, or if you think he's calling on the flop with high cards and folding the turn. That happens a lot on low paired boards, for example. Say the board is 525, people like to call with high cards on that board, but then they'll fold the turn often, but people are not calling with high cards as much on these low coordinated boards, especially when we're blocking ace highs with our hand. It's more unlikely that he's going to have an ace high. And here's also, if you guys were curious about what the weak pair looked like, you can highlight that as well. So that's why it's a very long answer to say, that's why option E had merit that's the only bet that will probably fold sevens and nines. I don't know about you, but if I'm sitting there with 10-9 and somebody overbets the turn, I'm not feeling terrific here. So we're not sure it does that. So honestly, I probably should have put E into yellow right there. But I did want to show that it's a better bet, in my opinion, than C or D. And the other option is to bet C or D's amounts. And then bet river if you think that will fold a seven or a nine. But the vast majority of opponents in low to mid stakes will not fold those hands. Uh, the average call on the river versus a triple barrel is 80%. And a lot of the data I looked at from low to med medium stakes, which is really interesting because the uh, there's, there's a question of framing in the book, The Undoing Project. Uh, it's a neuroeconomic test that they do. Uh, you'll recognize it as the Asian disease problem if you read that book. And the number they come up with is 80% in a very similar scenario where people either have to gamble to win a larger amount or to consent to a certain loss. Uh, it's very fascinating if you get into it. But it, yeah, versus good opponents, if you triple barrel there, you're more likely to get a seven or a nine to fold. You'll need to develop that triple barrel as you move up in stakes, but you shouldn't be using it much now because you're really going to be playing Beethoven to a cow most of the time. Most people at low to medium stakes will not appreciate that. So let's put you in another situation, guys. So same, now I'm going to change the hypothetical. You, know, you now have queen of spades, nine of diamonds. You raise preflop to 2.5x. 
the big blind calls, same stack sizes. The board comes seven of diamonds, four of hearts, nine of clubs. You see about the flop, he called. The turn is the king of hearts. What would you like to do in this situation? So, a few people saying E, some people saying C, a couple people saying A to check. I always know when I really put the test together in a way I like because I see answers all over the board. See, a lot of C and D's, few E's. All right. You guys curious which one it is? You just go ahead and bet there. Um, you, you will, you will need to balance versus better opponents eventually, but right now I think you should play mo more or less exploitatively, which is most of the opponents you're going to be playing against, especially if you guys go to Vegas, you're only going to get 30 to 40 hands with most of your opponents. Just try to play his hand. Your hand is easy to play. It's right there in front of you. Try to imagine his hand and what the average guy would do with it, and you'll usually be okay. Uh, so checking, check, checking does have merit on occasion when you're trying to defend your turn checking range here. I don't think you need to defend it as much in low to medium stakes because I think people call way too much on the turn in low to medium stakes. So I think generally you should bet one third pot or half pot because most people will just auto call with any pair versus those bets. It's only when you go beyond half pot that people start thinking. And betting 1.5x pot, that would be really good if you'd already over bet, perhaps, but I wouldn't do it out the gate. So maybe that shouldn't be red, maybe that should be yellow. So you bet 600 here into 1200, and our big blind calls. The river is the two of clubs. Your move, gentlemen and ladies, what would you like to do? So we have a couple, couple B's and C's, a lot of A's, all over the board. See, I'm glad we're talking about this. We need to get everybody on the same page. Let's see. Oh, oh, it is even down the middle, every option, except for E. Nobody wants to do E. That's the one. I think at low to medium stakes, guys, you can get away with a bet here. Uh, betting one third pot, half pot. I think when you deal with low to medium stakes opponents, I am just flabbergasted when I study poker to see what people will call one third pot or half pot with. Uh, you'll even see a four call on that river sometimes versus half pot, which is just bizarre. Especially low to medium stakes players. They, let's be honest, guys. We want to play poker when we show up to the poker room. We don't show up to fold. So if there's a missed draw out there, a lot of guys will find a way to call as long as you don't bet too much. So a lot of guys will go, oh, Jack-10 made a double gutter on the turn, 10-8 uh, missed, 5-6 uh, missed. So, yeah, of course I'm going to call there with my 4. If you go to 2 thirds, I actually, I'm fine with that as well. I think you're gambling a little bit to get more money, which I really like. Uh, my only worry is that tends to get the average player to start thinking. I think D is fine too. Uh, I don't think E uh, we should be doing too much unless you have some history with the guy. And checking, ch checking isn't, you should check if the guy knows you're capable of a thin value bet and knows what to do against it. Because people always say, but what if they raise there as a bluff? The truth is, though the only time you should check there is if this person is a very good player, which at low to mid stakes, which I think is what most of us are playing, 
it, or even you'll go to WPTs and a lot of guys don't have that gear, right? Once you get to Vegas and LA, guys have that. Europe, they have that. But a lot of the smaller WPTs, they won't have that. But in general, people, people are terrible at bluffing rivers. Remember, for people to get to that river, they need to check call twice. Not many guys check call ace high so they can check call ace high on the turn in the hopes that they bet that you bet thinly on the river so they can check raise. People get to the river with misdraws and pairs. As we discussed earlier, mostly pairs. It's so difficult to teach a guy to turn a seven into a bluff there. It's harder to find in a database. And usually the number of draws that turn themselves into a bluff, first of all, you can't count every draw as a bluff because that means this person bluffs 100% of the time with all their missed draws. It's very hard to know that about someone. So, but even if you did count every combo of Jack-10 there in 5-6, it would still be a very difficult, com combinatoric-wise, it's not a terrific call. And most of the time, I do not believe you can count even half of them. If you think of what percentage of people really turn those missed draws into a bluff, and almost nobody turns a mediocre pair into a bluff there like they should. Also, research indicates people are horrendous at folding on rivers. Curiosity equity is a hell of a thing, especially if they can muck their hand and not have to show anyone. He has many garbage pairs there when he calls from the big blind with today's ranges. Every database on earth shows people folding their high cards on flops and having a hard time folding pairs on later streets. Take advantage of that. New hypothetical. You raise preflop, 250, 2.5x, the big blind calls. The board comes out, seven of hearts, five of clubs, four of hearts. You have queen of spades, nine of diamonds. You see bet flop, big blind calls. The turn is the six of diamonds. The big blind checks to you. What would you like to do? All right, uh, we have a number of A's, a few people saying E. So uh, a lot of A's and B's. One B, two B's now. Somebody said attack his, I'm going to bring that up. Okay, guys. So someone said, if I believe they're calling with high cards, I fire there. And that's actually a really good point that didn't make this lecture. Is there are guys that will call with just random ace highs on that board. In which case, that does change the ranging. Uh, I think in general, though, people, well, we'll get into this in just a bit. This is a board you generally can double barrel on. The lone king over card from earlier isn't usually enough to scare someone off of a pair because people feel like they're giving up something when they flop a pair and they don't like doing that. But four to a straight does spook a lot of people. So I think one third pot probably won't do anything, but half pot, two thirds pot, 1.5x pot, I think you're pretty good on. Uh, there's one hypothetical in which you should check. We'll see if you guys know what it is. Let's say you bet 600 here and you don't even think he's folding sevens. You think he hero calls with a seven. Let's say we see bet the flop and he calls with open-ended straight draw or better. He folds his bare high cards. He slow plays all of his big hands, which makes our double barrel worse. And he somehow calls with a seven on a seven, six, five, four board on the turn. We'll assume he folds his mess flush draws. Well, if he does that, he's only defending 64.2% of the time on the turn. Our half pot C bet needs to work 33% of the time. He's folding 35.8% of the time. If he raises any sets, two pairs, or straights on the flop, our turn bet works more. If he hates his seven and folds, it works more. Guys, what is 
the most important question on that board when you see bet there and you're thinking about double barreling. This took me a long time to learn. What do you think is the most important question to ask yourself on that board? I didn't put a timer for this, but get, give yourself a few seconds to think about it. It's does the guy call with bare gut shots? That adds a lot of combinations of straight on that term because it is so easy to make a gut shot. Uh, to, it's so easy for him to have a combo with an eight in it, right? Many regulars will not just call with 10-8 offsuit, no backdoor draw on a 7-5-4 board. But if you get a recreational guy playing against you, you have to be careful. You only want to double barrel against regs who, want, who know how to fold pairs. And by the way, guys, when I say regs, I don't mean that as in they're good players. I just mean they're regularly there. There's lots of guys at low to mid stakes poker who just show up every day like it's their job and they do not make money. And a lot of regs know you should probably fold high cards to a C bet out of position if it doesn't have much working. And a lot of them know, okay, I can't really call with a pair on this turn if I don't really know what to do on the river. Those are the guys you're talking. However, if you see a guy never fold a turn or river or just never fold in general, that's a guy who likes to fold gut shots. Uh, that's a guy who likes to call gut shots on the flop, and that's a guy who doesn't like to fold pairs on turn and river. So anyways, guys, what we learned today, when we continuation bet somewhat coordinated boards, people tend to fold their high cards. The vast majority of their calling combinations are pairs that match community cards. It's difficult to get people to fold pairs in low to mid stakes, we need a horrible board run out or an opponent that is somewhat disciplined. If our pair beats the vast majority of paired board combinations, we should keep firing. Thank you guys for your time today. By the way, before I go, do you mind if I tell you about a deal pokercoaching.com is going on? I'd be happy to let you know if you're into it. Type one in the chat if you want to, know, if you want to hear. And we are just blowing up with one all right guys it's a short one today although this one's near and dear to my heart so you can get a seven day trial right now at pokercoaching.com which has over 400 interactive poker hand quizzes over 30 coaching challenge webinars four new hand quizzes every week you get to attend a live coaching challenge webinar with two-time WPT champion Jonathan Little every month. And uh, I really love making the quizzes on, I honestly love my job, period, because it's really fun to help people learn how to play poker. It's, I don't know, just growing up, I really loved watching coaches on the sidelines of football games play. Because you think about it, they're just playing chess that's going really fast, right? And I always thought I always thought that would be such a neat job, and I really get to do that every day, and that's really fun. And uh, the cool thing with PokerCoaching.com is I get to do multi-level quizzes, so there's pausing. Uh, it's very high-tech. You get to pick your uh, decisions, and then you get to hear why you should do what it is. And it's a really fun way to help people deliberately practice. You're not a passive participant. You're very much a part of the process. You are in the experience and asking yourself what you would do in that. And luck luckily, fortunately, we've had a few people really benefit from this process, this type of deliberate practice. Uh, this tweet blew me away. 57-year-old uh, uh, software engineer, Thomas Kornichuk, I hope I'm saying that right, tops a 608 entry field to win the WCP circuit at TV Poker Room May event, earning $193,439 in his first circuit ring. And he was nice enough to tweet us, um, myself as well. Hey, thanks Alex for all the instruction. It paid off WCP circuit and TV Poker Room. Many thanks also to Jonathan Little. So that was very fun. Uh, Thomas, I get a bunch of tweets. I'm not sure if I always see them. So I just want to let you know if you're watching this, I really appreciate you tweeting out. I'm so happy you got that result. That's so neat. Uh, that honestly made my day when I first saw it. And also guys, what we have going on right now, 
a really cool promo that John put together. Uh, you can enter to win 1% of Jonathan Little's World Series of Poker action. And not just that, you can enter at pokercoaching.com slash WSOP. One lucky giveaway winner will receive 1% of his 2019 WSOP tournament action. That 1% will be calculated based on participating events in Las Vegas during the 2019 WSOP tournament. You will also get a one-year, if you win, you will also get a one-year membership to PokerCoaching.com, a $468 value, six recent poker books from DNB Poker, my publisher, a $200 value. So of course I'm biased, I think they're awesome. And everyone who enters will get a free ebook, Jonathan Little's Poker Workbook, volume one, just for entering. The deadline to enter this giveaway is Sunday, May 26th. That's at pokercoaching.com slash WSOP. And the previous one, your free trial can just be had at pokercoaching.com. All right, guys, I'm going to be answering your questions in just a second. Thank you for attending. I really appreciate your time. I know you could be anywhere tonight, uh, but you chose to be with me watching one of my PowerPoints with me discussing poker. So I just... I'm very appreciative. Thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure. Have a great night.